Harvard and Yale, one of the most storied rivalries in all of college sports. Yale's Mie Aoni, the league's player of the year. Bryce Aiken leads number one Harvard. Today they square off with a ticket to the big dance on the line. Welcome to the Ivy League Basketball Championship presented by TIAA as part of Champ Week presented by Principal. Happy to welcome you to New Haven, Connecticut inside of Lee Amphitheater. The regular season co-champions Yale and Harvard for the Ivy League's bid to the NCAA tournament. Harvard getting by Penn, the final score doesn't do that game justice, and Yale came back from a seven-point deficit with five and a half minutes to play to beat Princeton. Harvard, happy to have Bryce Aiken back after almost a year away, came back in January, he's been their catalyst. This is the guy we were all excited to see, and he's performed that way in league play, and he was outstanding, in particular yesterday when they needed plays late. He is their closer, he made them, he got them over the hump. On the other side, Mieoni did the same thing. He fouled out Miles Stevens, one of the best guards and best defenders in the league, and then took over showing why 20 plus NBA scouts were in the building to see him. 23 points, five assists, eight boards. He'll have to be critical in this game, but bear in mind, folks, Yale lost to Harvard on this floor on a last second shot by Bryce Aiken. Oney fouled out late in that game, and that was the difference. Third time these teams meet this year, Harvard came in 6-0 against the tournament field winners on February 1st in Cambridge by 16 and not long ago February 23rd by that lone Bryce Aiken bucket. It's Harvard in the white and Yale on its home floor in the road blues. Not that abnormal because the Ivy League plays back to back so on the second out of back to backs the home team wears their road units. Lewis immediately gets double teamed in the post by Reynolds and Bruner tries to dribble out of it into the corner and goes cross court four to shoot for Kirkwood, the rookie of the year in the league. And as the shot clock expires on Aiken, it's Yale basketball. Tommy Emmerker at Harvard like to play inside out to take a look at Emmerker. He's done a great job here. Lewis is going to get doubled on the catch. You saw he handled it okay. He's got to be better. The pace at which Yale plays, Tommy Amaker said, part of their defensive lingo, they've got to sprint back and then build out from there. This possession will be a little bit different, but Yale, a team that plays at the fastest tempo in the league and top 40 in the country. And they got out to a double-digit lead here when they played a couple weeks ago, and it was mostly in transition, beating guys down the court. Blake Reynolds getting layups, Oni getting open in transition. He had 17 of his 21 points in that game in the first half, most out of transition. They've got to get back first. Got a whistle and a push off on Aiken. And no surprise, that's a critical matchup for James Jones, having Trey Phils guarding Bryce Aiken, able to stay down, not foul him, and Aiken picks up a foul early on. Jones, the dean of Ivy coaches in his 20th season, as Yale plays for its fifth NCAA tournament bid and first since 2016. Phil's on the drive. First two of the game. You want to make Aiken guard. He doesn't like to do it on the defensive end very often and Phil's taking advantage going all the way to the 10. Here comes Kirkwood. Bruner is big, but he's capable of pushing it himself. Oni pestered by Kirkwood. The junior guarded by a freshman. He's been very good this season in league play. We know he has a freshman taking advantage of that, using his smarts and his skill level. There's Copeland, fades away. Tommy Amaker said something about him. He's not just fast, he's also quick. What's the difference? First of all, speed is fast. It's point A to point B in a straight line, but he can stop and start at a level that we've never seen in this league, to be very honest. His level of change of pace and the speed is a, quick, is a brutal combination. And Tommy said, Oni's an amazing and special player. He's an NBA guy. But Copeland's the guy we have to stop. stop. He had 21 points in their last meeting, 14 before. You have to make it difficult for him. But his mid-range game, Copeland, is special. So the question will be, can they stop him in transition? And how well can Harvard do with Aiken? who in the first matchup against Yale scored just five, but the second game scored 28. 
Yeah, he was still coming back to full health when they had a chance to play him. Just his third game back. Yeah, now that, that looked like a pretty good block to me. And he lived at the free throw line here in their last meeting. He was 13 to 15, and Trey Phils fouled him on two threes and two pull-ups. And Phils is an outstanding defender. He was a little bit over-eager, the coaches were telling me. He's got to stay down, contest late, and let him get those, don't let him get shots up, but contest the shot late, don't foul him. Good defensive rotation for Harvard. The freshman catchings deterring Copeland. What a mismatch inside. Reynolds had 16 yesterday and drops it over the shoulder. They got caught in the switch and one of their guards, Christian Juzang, on Blake Reynolds. That is a brutal matchup for the Crimson. Quick pass out of the double. The Crimson worked the perimeter. Juzang front rims the three-point try. Yell off to a great start. 10-3 and three in non-conference play. Their best start out of league since 91-92. And that extended going back several more decades as they opened up 17-4. and four. Just went 2-2 two and two in the month of March, interestingly enough. They felt like they were complacent a little bit down the strip. Yeah, it's a unique thing for folks watching this game that have been familiar with the league for a long time. When you were in first place and second place, the tension was there the entire time because the regular season champ was getting that bid, and you had to be sharp every single weekend. But now with the tournament, that's the only downside is the team in first. The ducking doesn't matter, but as much. They had complacency, they felt, because they knew they were in first and in the tourney, but did they want the regular season champ? Yale turns a four-on-three break into a Jordan Bruner layup. The junior from Columbia, South Carolina, coming off a 10.7 rebound game yesterday. Harvard's offensive struggles are hurting their defense right now. Some of the turnovers, some missed shots, and that's leading to transition baskets or transition opportunities the other way. Harvard co-champ of the league this year with 10 wins, both teams 10 and four. First time in more than three decades that a team won the league with just 10 conference wins. Kirkwood, the Ivy League Rookie of the Year, drains the three to make it a three-point game. That young man's playing with a tremendous amount of confidence. You can see it in that shot, really a two-on-one break. Aiken flared out to the three-point line. Kirkwood decided to stop and shoot the triple. Oney had Lewis off balance. Blocking foul under the hoop on the collision with catchings. And this is what makes this team special. Every guy that gets the ball off the rim can get out and transition. Jordan Gruner, athletic, gifted, finger roll. He's got his hometown team up to three. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is presented by TIAA. Live your definition of success with TIAA.org. About four and a half minutes in, and it's Yale by three over Harvard. The Ivy League regular season co-champs playing for the bid to the NCAA tournament. Mike Cousins, Dallin Cuff, the former Columbia Lion. Pretty impressive for Harvard when you consider they played a big portion of this year without two player of the year caliber players. Yeah, Aiken misses the first half of the year. Seth Towns misses the entire year. Seth Towns is the reigning player of the year in the Ivy League. And for them to accomplish this, to get to this point in time, it was a, a, it more impressive given not having him on the floor, not having Aiken. But what that did allow them to do is develop some more depth. And guys like Kale Catchings has really stepped up. Uh, you know, Noah Kirkwood, the rookie of the year, has stepped up. Danilo Juricic. All these names I'm mentioning will be factors in this game. And they've had to be because of no Seth Towns and his double-digit points, almost double-digit rebounds as he averages the top guy in this junior class, which was a top 10 class. It was the 10th rated class by ESPN.com. And four top 100 players in that group. And these guys have really taken the mantle for this program and taken it to another level. And they've got another big class coming in next year as well with an ESPN 100 player at the top of their five-man class. Actually stolen from uh, Yale, not stolen, but those two were in on it. Ledlam was a guy that Yale wanted really bad. They thought they were in talking to their coaching staff. But in the end, he's going to go to Harvard, a product of Northfield, Mount Hermon, one of the prep schools around here. And uh, that's going to be a uh, even adding to this historic rivalry between these two clubs. Deep breath for Oni, the league's player of the year. For this tournament, there are about 20 NBA scouts credentialed to come and watch him. 
and, and rightfully so. I've talked to so many throughout the course of the year. I've seen a number of his games live and chatted with scouts at every opportunity. They love his, his athletic bodies, his NBA-ready body. He's got about a seven-foot wingspan, broad shoulders. He's got strength. He's about 6'6". He can knock down threes outside the NBA line and put it on the deck and finish. And the one thing they want to see him do a little better is decision making. He should be a two to one, at least assist to turnover guy. And he's not quite there yet. But they've all been very impressed, and they feel like he could be drafted in that you know 40 around the 40 spot in the NBA draft if he came out. Only a junior. If he came out, told me yesterday he's going to go to the combine if invited and assess his situation after this season. Doesn't hurt to get those opinions as he pulls from about 16 feet. And just sends it wide. Ivy League hasn't had a player drafted since Jerome Allen back in 1995. Quite a feat. Swain was able to dissuade Aiken from taking the shot. Lewis on the hop with the left hand. Beat the double team. Well, Paul Atkinson was, was posted up with him. Bruno was just a step late to get there on the double. He was able to hop through and split it and finish. Now Lewis tries to defend Atkinson. Now Lewis grabs the rebound. He had an interesting game yesterday. Sat for a good portion of the middle 20 minutes of that game, but came in late and was a defensive stopper for Harvard. Great block. And he turns away. Oni going to the rim. And that's what's been unique about this team. And we talked about not having Seth Towns, a guy of his caliber. But this is there's so much depth on this squad as Lewis steps over and swats the reigning player of the year. It, guys have, so many different guys have stepped up at different times. And Tommy told us before the game that the word sacrifice has been the motto for this team. And they started saying it last spring. They said, if we want to get to the point where we're going to get to, we're going to have to sacrifice our individual goals or individual self for the greater good of the team. And Lewis is a great example. I mean, talking to some guys around the league today, in the last couple days, if you would have told us before the year Chris Lewis wouldn't be an all-league player and Harvard would be here without Seth Towns, nobody could figure out how that equation would actually add up. But they've been able to do it because so many other guys have stepped up. And Lewis, when his time has come and he is called upon, he has performed. That's good for Azar Swain. Got to make him put on the deck. The kid's an absolute assassin. The fans of the league remember Laurent Rivard used to play for Harvard. He plays a similar role for this team. He comes in looking to get up jump shots, play inside out, and you have to make him put it on the deck. Well, every time Harvard has turned it over, Yale has converted that into a basket. And the Crimson, empty on their first three shots, have hit the last four. An enduring series, but Harvard has taken the last four, including both matchups this season, winning by 16, and in the second one, just by two points. Bruner stuck under the basket, over the top of Turicic, and artfully uses the window. Bruner's a kid that's still, he's had four knee surgeries and at, at, at 20 years old already. Last year missed the entire season due to a knee injury, but a guy that doesn't fully trust his body, but his skill level is off the charts. And when he becomes the athlete that he used to be pre some of these surgeries, if he gets there, he could be an Ivy League player of the year next year is what James Jones thinks. And Yon Oni is still a junior as well, and he's saying that. Copeland, the drive and the kick for Swain. Another three-pointer for the sophomore from Rockton, Massachusetts. Say it again, you cannot help off him. I, I know guys are dangerous, that's what makes this team so hard to guard, but you can't help off Azar Swain. Oh, oh. <laughs> Man. Bryce Aiken scores at will. Aiken's not just one of the, not the best lead guard in this league, he's one of the best point, like, lead guards in the country. The guy's an absolute baller. So is he. Alex Copeland. Can every trip down the floor be that good? I hope so. <laughs> Corner try goes back iron for Kirkwood. Atkinson waits out a flying Bassey. And again, in transition, Copeland able to get all the way downhill, get into the teeth of the defense. You have to stop them at the point of attack. This is not easy to do this, but you have to find a way to get off, square him up, and slow down this Yale Bulldogs transition. If the first nine minutes are any indicator, we may be headed for yet another fantastic finish, as this rivalry has showed and we will tell you about when we come back.
Harvard and Yale, an enduring rivalry in many sports. More recently, basketball, the 2015 Ivy League playoff game. At the end of the regular season, both teams were 11 and 3. It came down to the wire, a couple late chances, but Harvard went to the NCAA tournament. Then in 2017, the first year of mm. Ivy Madness at the Palestra, the semis, Yale, a two point winner over Harvard. And then we bring you back to just last month in this building. And this was, Yale was leading by six with two minutes to go, but this is the indelible image there. Aiken hitting the shot in regulation to have them win the game. Yale, four possessions down the stretch. Harvard gets the win, adding to this rivalry. These fans, just flat out, the school's fans, they don't like each other. And there are so many memorable meetings they had in years past. The beginning of sporting history. You have to go back to the water and rowing. Who doesn't remember the 852 crew regatta? I think no one. I mean, everybody listening knows exactly what happened <laughs> that day. And more recently, getting to play the football matchup at Fenway Park. Really cool. That is very cool. And Aiken has been a guy, and he didn't just break the hearts of the Bulldogs. I mean, if you're a Columbia Lions fan, you know it all too well. Triple overtime earlier this year. Single overtime. He beat them last weekend. So... He's been the closer in multiple games for this Harvard team. They've won three games in OT, other games at the buzzer. But this has been an issue all year with them turning it over, as they almost did there. But Aiken's been able to bail them out late game a lot of times. Was that cathartic for you to get to mention the triple overtime Columbia game? Cathartic, painful, whatever you want to say. <laughs> Mike Cousins along with the former Columbia Lion, Dallin Cuff. Juzang, short on the three-point try. Harvard that made six of its last seven prior to that possession, and Yale hasn't missed in five shots. It's a Yale team that's top 20 in the nation in effective field goal percentage. Weighted three-pointers like that, along with their two-point percentage. When they don't turn it over, they are an elite offensive team. That's why they could be a threat in the NCAA tournament. Anybody, Anytime you have an elite skill, something you do better than almost anybody, you could win in the tourney, and that's what this team does is shoot the ball. That was the first basket of the afternoon for Oni. You go back to the 2015 game at the Palestra, and as we spoke with Tommy Amaker, Harvard's head coach, before the game, he said he feels like that game, you know, in his opinion, not to say that it's the certified 100% truth, but really was perhaps the impetus for this tournament as the Ivy League became the last league to have a tournament for its NCAA bid. Yeah, and that's an opportunity for everybody to see what had happened there at that, at that venue at the Palestra and take it forward and say, maybe we should do this more often. The great Carl Reuter on the call for what was a very memorable game in the Palestra, which has now been the predecessor to what we've seen great tournament after tournament in the last three years. This year, the first year in year three that it's not at the Palestra in Philadelphia, and now it goes to a school-by-school -school basis as it's planned right now. All right, let's get this out of the way. I do not... Enjoy this plan set forth here. I do think that we should, I say we, as the Ivy League, you have this special, unique place, the Cathedral of Basketball in this country being the Palestra. That should be the home base. Even Tommy Amaker agrees with that. He would give up, seed the competitive advantage for the greater good, for our product to be on display to the nation on this day in the house of basketball that our league owns. It should be there or it should be at the top seed. If we're not going to have it always there, put it at the top seed so it's completely merit-based, that is fine. I don't see this event potentially successful if you have to go to Hanover, New Hampshire. I'm not sure people are going to show up at Dartmouth. I'm not sure people are going to show up at Cornell. Columbia, we haven't been good in, in, in decades. Do we deserve to host that event? Say we sneak into the tournament, do we deserve to host that event at that point in time? That is my question. I know the league doesn't appreciate that, but I would rather see it first seed or at the Palestra. Regardless of a team's record year by year, do you think it would just be equitable, though, to move it around as it's planned? Yeah, it's it's equitable, but at the same time, like, our league is inequitable in terms of how it breaks down. Like, in terms of whether, what success you've had, what, what you're committing to the sport, what you're bringing in terms of the actual event itself, your ability to put on the event at the highest level, your ability to sell it out, your community caring about the event, all those things aren't the same school to school. And when you have the palestra in your building, nobody's going to match that. And in particularly that recruit, that 16-year-old sitting on the couch watching the game, if we're in Hanover, New Hampshire, and there's 1,000 people there, that doesn't look good. If you're at the palestra and there's 6,000 there and you can't hear a thing and you're telling all these stories, I want to be part of that. Just to walk the halls in that building uh, is an experience of itself. I didn't win a game there and I loved everyone. <laughs> I didn't even play well and I loved everyone. Aiken gets turned away by the long arms of Bruner at the basket. 
And the fastest team in the Ivy League speeds down the floor. Great passing. Reynolds, back-to-back -back possessions. He scores from close range. Yale has made eight in a row. That's your big-to-big -big right there. That's Bruner, your foreman, throwing a one-handed bullet pass to Blake Reynolds, flashing in the post, and then finishing at the rim. High-level skill. And Bassey with the crowd silencing lane. Bassey's going to be critical in this game. The junior, last year Tommy Hammerford say he was an M the MVP of that team that had Seth Towns, the league player of the year on the squad. But he guarded their best guy. He came up with big rebounds, big shots. But he's been dealing with an ankle injury the latter half of Ivy play. But here he is again, getting a good look in transition. He'll be integral in this game. This game is moving at a heaving for breath pace right now. Copeland crossover, drops it in. And you know, this is a back-to-back -back game, but the Ivy League plays back-to-back -back games all the time. It's the ultimate back-to-back. -back. Guys are used to this, and you're right, the pace of play right now is at an electric pace, but guys don't seem tired, and Copeland in particular has a pep in his step. Bassey bodies his way into Phils. Too much on it. Reynolds has been indispensable on both ends under the rim. Foul underneath a 10-point game. Two indefatigable squads. The ultimate back-to-back -back with the NCAA tournament bid for the league on the line. SAT words. Yale by 10. Mie Oni only one for six from the floor, so they've been doing a great job spreading out the scoring. 7.23 left in the first. Coming up tonight, ESPN's Bracketology Special brought to you by Lowe's. We will finally know what the net really means, what it stands for tonight <laughs> as they fill out the field of 68. Sports Center starts 5.15, and the guys reveal the field of 68 as the teams are announced. Everything's on ESPN and the ESPN app, Dallin. There are about 15 teams that have lost sleep wondering what the net really means. What, what are we really going to get to? You joke, but it is going to be important. I'm interested to see how that factors into who gets the spot in the 68. Now, you mentioned Oni is one of six, but this Yale team is way more than Oni. That's what makes that they are the most talented team in this league, folks. Everybody knows that. Tommy Amrick will be the first one to tell you that. But do they play like that consistently on both ends of the floor? Not always. That's why they've struggled down the stretch. We talked about their complacency, but today they're showing why they are the most talented team and the deepest team in the league. A rare misstep from Reynolds, the senior from Jackson, Missouri. We saw only one for six, and the rest of the team, 12 for 15 from the floor. They're getting in transition. They're getting in rhythm. They're getting the shots they want. Harvard has to be better defensively, a little more disruptive, and better job containing the ball. And Aiken, if he's not going to score, can certainly distribute. He gives it up for Catchings, who made his starting debut just a freshman last month here in New Haven and scored 16 points. And that, that was a big time performance by him. Great shot there, but in that game, they hit a white out here. It was raucous in this environment. You walk into that, your first time in the Harvard-Yale rivalry in a game you're trying to win to win a regular season championship and you have 16 points. That really told me something about that young man's character and his ability. This is where Aiken can be great. He'll be, he's at his best is when he's also playmaking for others because he draws so much attention. You see three guys collapsed on him. He was able to kick that out, throw that pass right in the shot pocket. Catchings goes right up. Great play by Bruner there. He was going three-quarter high and came across Lewis's body to tip it out of bounds. Because if he didn't, that was an easy two for yeah. Lewis. I would like to see them right now play a little more through Lewis, give him a touch, and that double comes. The last time they, they saw the double team, they did a good job of getting it out, getting it reversed. And Christian Juzang got a really good look at three. You can get some offense facilitated through Lewis. Aiken deep three. Oh my goodness! It's not surprising to anybody. He just flexed at his own bench. They know what he's capable of. And Alex Copeland walking toward us and toward his coach James Jones just said, like, ah, what should I, like, almost like, what, what, what can I do? And James goes, get up. Like, you can't step back. It doesn't matter if that three is set, uh, that screen is set 26 feet from the hoop. You still need to go over that screen because he will shoot it. You take a look. Copeland getting a little lax, decides to go under, and he goes, oh, no, I'm done. 
Scouting report's got to say never under the screen, right? It really should. That's why he looks back to coach like, oh, I, I, what should I have done? We'll go over the screen like we talked about because you're not safe even beyond NBA range. Aiken came back to action after almost a year away. January 21st against Howard. Scored 16 points in that game, and just a couple games later, it was the first Harvard-Yale game of the season. But his sophomore year, I mean, it was almost a year totally out, but the beginning part of that year, he wasn't fully healthy. They were trying to get him back, and it, it really was almost a year and a half since he had been 100%. So to see him get back in the Ivy League and then start to really tear apart the Ivy League on, outside of the coaches, it was great for everybody watching to see a young man get back to the spot that he we know he could get to and then be able to perform at that level. He is a special player. Yale's now a perfect 20 for 20 from the free throw line yesterday and today. They went 16 for 16 yesterday, the 15th team this year to go perfect at the line with at least 16 tries. Jurich hits straight away. That's what he'll do. He hits big shots. He had 12 in their last game. He had nine in their first meeting. He'll knock down threes. He'll rebound. He does some of the dirty work. A really good glue guy for this squad. That's one of the things that concerned James Jones, is he said, beyond Aiken, they've got two of everything. Yep. I got to chat with him as he got the tie knotted up, the cufflinks going back in the locker room. And that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the big concerns, is that they're so deep. They started 17 different guys this year. They cleared the rest of the country. Second place was Detroit, started only 13 guys. Only 13. Only 13. And it is crazy. And, and, and you know, James really aware of it. And, and all these different guys that can come in. Think about their first meeting. Robert Baker came off the bench, hit four threes, the seven-footer. That's a career high for him. But you know, that's a guy you don't expect to come in and do that. He comes in and changes the game, helps them win. Uh, at home when they played up at Harvard, and then you have a guy like Catchings come in here, you're seeing Juricic, there's so many dudes, we keep talking Aiken, but this team is really deep and they get contributions up and down the roster. Fouls on Juricic, sixth team foul with five minutes left in the first half. Tony's free throw routine, rather long. It's almost Paul Malone-esque. Surprised they don't uh, count at him to 10 like they used to do to Malone. <laughs> That's how you get to Ivy League Player of the Year. Top four in those offensive categories. Tommy Amaker was vocal about saying, Bryce Aiken, got a really good case for being Player of the Year. Yeah. But on the other side, how many times do you have a guy who is a draftable NBA prospect pass through the league, and it's not often? Now, you just you mentioned it earlier, Jerome Allen, last guy to get drafted out of the Ivy League. He's got some, obviously, off-the-court issues going on. Won't really get into that, but Oni is a special guy that every scout I talk to sees him in that, you know, around that 40 potential pick, 40th potential pick. We'll see what happens, but he's a, we're enjoying him while we have him here right now, for sure. Really good eyes from Lewis to see Juricic sprinting down the lane. The last Yale player to get drafted was Chris Dudley. Now, territorial pick for Bill Bradley. Had not encountered that before. Really kind of a cool thing, at least to the best of my knowledge of, of reading about it, was teams could take players who are within their radius, and it did not count, let's say, you took that pick. It didn't start the draft as pick number one at that point. So good for publicity. Obviously, a, very much a pre-every game being televised era. And good for the Knicks, too, because you have, you know, the player of the year in college basketball gets to go to your team without using a pick. Let's not forget my guy Armand Hill, who recruited me, and I played for him for freshman year at Columbia. It was the ninth pick by the Hawks back in 76. Great coach, great player. Harvard, I like the last possession going through Lewis. I continue to, I keep saying, to give him some touches a little bit to facilitate some more offense for them in the interior and not rely on Aiken so much. Real has to get into the game, played just three minutes yesterday for the Crimson. And Aiken uses the left hand, makes it 35 32. Ball screen defense not good enough there. He was able to get downhill. They never. Never showed, never did anything to deter him. Good screen by Atkinson. Oh. Clears up space for Oni. Well, Aiken's got 15 points already, and Oni, who scored 23 yesterday, now has nine.
basket from distance off the bench, fired up, and points back toward the Bulldogs as he jogs down the floor. And that's the guy that can, he can come off the bench too against Penn. And in one of their meetings earlier this year, he came off, had four threes. And that's a guy that's not a great shooter, but he shoot, when he's shooting with confidence, he can knock a few down, can change a game. Ball tipped by the Crimson, so Yale keeps it a two-point lead with 340 until halftime. League co-champs, this game has lived up to the billing so far. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Principal. We can help you plan for that. Of course, the key to any game, Barney, is avoiding complete capitulation. I will say, shout out to my guy Fonz, of course. We are both the best Irish guys around, I'm sure. Dallin O'Cuff. <laughs> Dallin O'Cuff. Seamus O'Toole and Dallin O'Cuff here. <laughs> Handsome Dan. Oh, will he travel if Yale ends up in the NCAA tournament? Joe Lenardi projecting them if they do win this game as a number 13 seed, Harvard as a number 14 seed. I would assume he has to travel. I was at the game last time they were in the tournament against Baylor, and they beat Baylor. Makai Mason went off for 31, who actually just played for plays for Baylor right now uh, in 2016. I don't recall if Handsome Dan was there, and those seeds I do totally agree with. 13 for Yale, a 14 for Harvard. Harvard's non-conference, they have had some bad losses non-conference as they went through stretches, obviously, without Aiken, no towns. They were trying to figure themselves out. Way different team now than they were even in the beginning of January. Mm. Aiken hit on the way up by Swain. I saw Harvard right at the turn of the calendar playing in Chapel Hill against North Carolina. The final score was not that close, but you thought that at certain points during that game, if Aiken or Towns had been on the floor, yep. totally different game against one of the best teams in the country. 100%. In all honesty, when they got this recruiting class and I started to see those guys play together freshman year, in particularly Lewis, Aiken, Towns, Bassey, and Baker too at the time, I thought this team would be a top 25 team their junior year. Now, injuries have derailed that, but next year, the, the sky, the, the ceiling, the roof is the ceiling, as MJ would say. They have their the ceiling is the roof. Ceiling is the roof. God, dagger. <laughs> they have, they've got tons of potential to be a top 25 team. I'm talking to their staff. They have a really good non-conference schedule. They like a lot. They can help prove that out. Um, so this team has, has a ton of bright, fu the bright future ahead of them. And here, the ceiling slash roof is about nine and a half stories up <laughs> in what looks like a Harry Potter-style building from the outside and a beautiful athletic facility inside. Very unique venues in the Ivy League, to say the least. And this one, the, the acoustics here are tough as a player. Was When it's even half full, you can't really hear anything. But when it's full as it is right now, it is difficult to communicate, to say the least. Harvard trailed by as many as 10 over the first 17 minutes. Now leading for the first time on a 6-0 run. Reynolds yesterday, 13 points in the first half, was mostly quiet for all of the second half, but hit a huge three-pointer from just about where he's standing right now late in the game. And where he's standing in the middle now, he's the middle of a 1-3-1 zone, and Aiken just threw it away. I love the two calls by James Jones. First and foremost, to go and attack Juricic in the post. He's not a great post defender. Go to your senior Blake Reynolds. He's able to lay it up. 1-3-1 zone. Turnover, they were a little disjointed. Does this building get the loudest of any in the league? I think with the Palestra's full, you really can't hear a thing. And bear in mind, when I played there, Penn was really, really good. And there's 6,000 people there. so there's a, And they used to be on top of you there. So you just, the whole building felt like it was coming in on you. This place is really loud, but the Palestra's unique in that regard. Reynolds called for the travel. This job bringing a little more pressure, speeding Reynolds up a little bit. They stay in the 1-3-1 zone. Aiken's seen it once. Now you want to try to attack this thing, get it into the short corners or the corners and overload the zone is what Harvard's going to look to do. Is you have Kirkwood setting up with his hands ready in the corner looking to get a, potentially get a shot on. Whoa. He does it again! Aiken more distributor yesterday. Score this afternoon. My man is in the zone. On the baseline, too quick on the pull-up. Copeland, he can stop at a moment's notice, and the defender just keeps on going. That's the, Again, we talked about his speed and his quickness, but his ability to stop on a dime, elevate over guys. He really gets up on that pull-up or in a mid-range shot. It's impressive. Kirkwood from the corner. Now Aiken 
to the opposite corner, finding Juricic. But Juricic gets in the corner. I wish they would flash another guy into the high post and overload that thing and look for something there. Wow, beautiful feed to find Reynolds slicing under the basket. Yale out in front by two. A minute 20 to go before the half. And with Aiken, he's a small guard. Bruner, over seven foot wingspan. Oni, seven foot wingspan. Copeland's a big guard at 6'4". There's a lot of length on top of this zone that can affect him. Aiken directs the offense. He scored the last eight for the Crimson. Bassey won in on the action. Out for Aiken. He just shot fake from midcourt. And Bruner had to respect it. <laughs> Out of the double team, it's Juricic for three. And Aiken, waiting near midcourt, gets back-to-back -back offensive rebounds. It's cliche, but it's true. It is hard to rebound on his zone, and Harvard is the number one team in the league in offensive rebound percentage. Wide open triple, gets his own miss, and this is a long defensive possession for Yale. Juricic going to the line for two free throws. That is huge. You have a chance to, to close out the half with some momentum. The building was going nuts. You got your stops, but you couldn't clean up the rebound and get out in transition. Great job by Harvard to keep attacking it. A couple ta uh, back taps to keep the ball alive. Two-point game, almost 30 to play in the first half. And we'll be back to Yale in 30 seconds. Champ Week comes to an end today. One of the final bids handed out, and you can't ask for a much better game than we've had so far. You'll have more good games later today as well on the pro side. Philadelphia, Milwaukee, 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. Bucks with the best record in the league. Coverage starts with NBA Countdown, 3 Eastern, noon Pacific. Everything available wherever you travel on the ESPN app. This game is why the Ivy League went to a tournament to have a chance to be on ESPN, a national TV, so that everybody can see the level of play in the Ivy League now. And I, I mean, I've already gotten a number of texts from people, oh my gosh, this game is unbelievable. For people that don't typically watch basketball or college basketball and don't realize this is what the Ivy League is putting forth week in and week out. There are competitive games, all eight teams are in it, and the top two are playing right now with everything on the line and showing you that not only but can they win in the tournament, there could be a threat. And it was a race that came down to the final weekend for the fourth spot yep. in this tournament. Penn edging out Brown, which would have been a first, partic a first time participant in the league tournament. Big last possession. Can you steal a little momentum here, play it on your home floor, get a basket to go into break? Oni at the bottom of your screen. Copeland takes it himself. 15-footer, around and out. Time for Harvard. Bassey trying to get contact as he goes up. No whistle. 43-42 at the break. Everybody take a breath. Take a breath. Guys in the studio, I'm sorry. You're heading for a fill. There's no doubt about it, this one. But maybe we'll have overtime and save you. Copeland and Reynolds, each with 10 for Yale. Oni with 9. Aiken with a game high, 21. Killing it from deep. Kevin and the guys in the studio, take it away. Welcome back to the Ivy League Basketball Championship presented by TIAA as part of Champ Week, presented by Principal. What else would you expect between the co-regular season champs of the Ivy League, Yale and Harvard, the Bulldogs by one at the break. Game high 21 for Harvard's Bryce Aiken, who's been fearless as he's foraged for points. Good word, baby. He's been balling, man. Let's make it more simple for me. 21 points. They're trying to keep contain on him, but it's been difficult. Here, you can't go underneath the screen. I don't care if he's out beyond the NBA range. He's feeling it, and he's capable of doing it. They went zone late. He stepped out again about 26 feet. You're going to have to contest him when he comes across half court, whether man or zone. He's been outstanding. His teammates have been very good, too. First half stats brought to you by Buffalo Wild Wings. Yale has spread out the score, and we've yet to see peak Mie Oni, two for seven from the floor. Big reason why he had two fouls. He had to manage some of that. Now, he played through a good amount of that, but that, that was key when they played here a couple weeks ago. He had foul trouble in the second half. 17 of his 21 came in the first half. Spent a lot of time on the bench. Ended up fouling out late in that game. 
he has to be able to play with fouls, with fouls and not get in foul trouble. Conversely, Harvard will see if they attack him and try to get another one as Blake Reynolds laid an elbow into Ketchum's face. An incidental one, and they're perhaps going to go to the monitor to take a look at this to review it to see if it would rise to the level of a flagrant one, which would be excessive or unnecessary contact. Well, James Jones is arguing right now with Dwayne Gladden, and first rate of way to Clarence Armstrong, the official that made the call, that he was in the cylinder. He was saying he wanted to see a cylinder call here. We'll take on a look. And again, it's about where his elbows are in relation to the ball. Is he's, are he's swinging the ball over his head, or his elbows more vertical than horizontal? That's a, that's a tough one. His elbows are pretty straight up, and it wasn't the first elbow on the pivot. It was coming through on the other side. That, it is, I mean, it is a basketball move. He's swinging the ball over his head to look to create some space and potentially throw out of it or make a move. And watching that, it looked like the forearms were more vertical, vertical than horizontal, which in that case can be ruled incidental contact. And it's tough luck for the defender who takes the elbow to the face. Yeah. Because when that rule was created, it was created to allow space for the player with the ball to still be able to possess the ball, move freely, but say if you were holding the ball like you were in a vice grip yep. with your elbows sticking out, you can't swing it that way. That's too wild. I think when you take a second look at that, too, the first elbow goes by, and he almost steps closer. I think like he gets into his cylinder and creates the contact. I don't. This shouldn't be, in my opinion, it should be a cylinder foul more than it should be a foul on Reynolds. Officials today, Earl Walton, Dwayne Gladden, and Clarence Armstrong, who's got his back to us right now. Well, the game was played at an electric pace in the first half. This is starting off a little bit slower, but we'll see how we get along. Both teams have a chance to talk more and just to finish on Oni, we'll see if Harvard tries to attack him and get him his third foul. Tommy said to us before the game, we talked about foul trouble and him getting in foul trouble. They're going to be aware of it. They're not going to force anything, but it's something they're definitely going to talk about. And if it starts to present itself, maybe looking for opportunities to try to drive him to maybe pick up another foul to impact this game. Oni presented a good challenge to James Jones's two foul participation playing rate, which is about 11%. That means 11% of the available minutes for starters after two fouls have been committed. And Oni played the final four minutes and 38 seconds after picking up his second foul in the first half, a guy that they need on the floor. They are going to say Gwen Gladden just came over and said it's an F1 foul on the elbow. 24 will shoot two. James Jones is not happy. Personally, I don't really agree with it either. Appreciate Earl Walton coming over to clarify that, saying that Catchings was not within the cylinder of Reynolds, and so that's why it's the flagrant one. I appreciate Earl coming over and giving more explanation. I just, like I said, I don't, I didn't see it that way, but it is what it is. They're making the call. Always appreciate the explanation because as officials have points of emphasis for rules adjudication, that's also another one that they're very cognizant of coming over to explain the rules as well, for sure. And we do have a great refereeing crew. First time I, when I first got on the floor and saw who the crew was, you know, Earl Walton, Dwayne Glad, and Clarence Armstrong are very good officiating crew. And just to go a little bit further into the rules, too, there are several bullet points that qualify for a flagrant one foul. One of them is illegal contact caused by the swinging of an elbow. And that's why they go to the monitor to make sure they get it right. And Reynolds was talking to Armstrong right there, still trying to understand because he thought his elbows were more, again, more vertical than horizontal, but in the end, it didn't matter. Even at 43, winner of this game, the Ivy League's representative in the NCAA tournament. Joe Lenardi's projections right now. Yep, they tried to go right in Oni. Right away, they put him into a post situation with Noah Kirkwood, rookie of the year in the league. This kid is confident, and he wanted, to, wanted the opportunity. They isolate him. Good move to now pivot by, and now Oni's got to realize there was no point in swatting down. When he left his feet, that was, that was poor fundamentals, especially with two fouls, but definitely don't swat down to give the ref the opportunity to call the foul. Him surrendering two points is less important than him having three fouls at this point in the game.
And the matchup remains the same at this end of the floor. Kirkwood, the freshman, guarding Oni, the junior. Tough defensive assignment in back-to-back -back days for catchings. It's Reynolds here, and yesterday in the 1-4 game, it was A.J. Broder of the Quakers of Pennsylvania. And Ketchings flexes right away, and rightfully so. Young freshman stood tall, and that was tough, taking a bunch of bangs from Reynolds, didn't give ground. And now Reynolds gets his third foul as well. So you've got Oni and Reynolds, a senior in Reynolds, and a, your junior player of the year in Oni with three fouls. Critical at this point in the game, because Reynolds gives you a little opportunity to pick and pop. He can knock down threes, a little more versatility offensively. Number 20, Paul Atkins, the so Atkinson, the sophomore that came in for him. Much more traditional post player. He'll battle, but he's not going to give you anything on the perimeter offensively. He's stuck behind Lewis. They double down. Nice. And Lewis called for the travel. Good team defense between Bruner and Atkinson. That's where you want your junior. Lewis, he's just got to be smarter for Tommy Amaker there. They've been doubling you. You know what's coming. He, he took a quick dribble and left his feet. Uh, there's nowhere to go there. You've got to accept it, be smart, make the right decision, the quick decision. That was not it. Bruner back again. Foul called on Catchings. Number three on him. Racked up four yesterday. If he scores, great. But it's his defense yep. that earned him that, that starting role back in the second game against Yale in February. And he's now started five of the last six. Six of seven, counting today. Right to the bucket for Atkinson. The best field goal percentage in the league for two straight years, about 70%. How about that pass by Alex Copeland, though? His fourth assist of the game, and as we said in the first half, Tommy Amaker focused on how do we slow down Copeland, keep him out of the lane, and keep him from creating for himself and his teammates. Didn't do it there. Oney steps back, doesn't need much space to let it go over Kirkwood. Fills and Aiken. Aiken wins the battle. And just... Phil's a really good defender. He has to get more resistance. He's got to step up and be able to try to flatten him out. Oni wasn't going to help on the strong side. You can't help off of Kirkwood. And Aiken knew that. He had the lane straight down. Aiken's got 23 now. That's his first two points of the second half. And the 21 for him were the most in any half this year. 25 for Aiken. And he's feeling it right now. The confidence is flowing through him. I'd like to see at times, we ask James Jones, will you run two at him, will you double him? They don't like to do it. Maybe in a straight ISO situation, might want to see a little more zone to get him to take a step back. Because right now, man to man, he is feeling it. He's in rhythm. Going past Phil's here, no help comes. Use the window. Also hit the pull-up if he wants to. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Principal. We can help you plan for that. Harvard with its largest lead up by five. Bryce Aiken has half of their points at this juncture. Earlier this season, a game against Columbia. Closer than you might have imagined, at least on paper, to start. He dropped 44 in this game and ended up hitting one of the most amazing shots of the season that sent this game to triple overtime. It was a great game, a fantastic basketball game. His performance was tremendous, but this is a shot that people are gonna remember. I don't know how he made this. Double clutch underneath a guy that's like 6'10", to nail a three to give him 44 points. Just a fantastic performance. Again, they won three overtime games just in league play alone, because Aiken is the best closer in this league, and he just takes and makes huge shots. Second most in a game for a Harvard player. Only behind the 45, Brady Merchant put on Brown back in March of 03. I remember Brady Merchant, heck of a player, lefty score. I know my guy Colin Davis remembers him. Put my man Colin on a poster one time and then yelled, oh no, in his face like eight <laughs> times. It was one of those games where I'm like, this isn't going too well. Play with a great guard, freshman uh, uh, point guard, Elliot Prosse Freeman. Like the nation and assist that you. If you dunk on somebody like that, you get to say whatever you want. I think, well, I think so. The refs don't always agree with that, but <laughs> Colin probably doesn't appreciate that shout out right there. He's probably not listening. Along with Dallin Cuff, Mike Cousins. 
Here on Yale's campus in New Haven, Connecticut. Winner goes to the NCAA tournament. Kirkwood, burst pass, Oni, and it jams with two. Oni was getting close there. Kirkwood initiated a little contact. You want to use your body, get in front of the trail defender. And Oni made a little, made a little contact. He does not need to pick up four. It makes way more sense for him to let that go. Oni clears space, 14-footer. Off no good, tipped up and in by Bruni. Offensive rebounds, tough to come by in this game. Big play by Bruder. He's got, he's a very quick jumper and got up first. Yale's enjoyed an advantage of as many as 10. Harvard, as much as seven. Loose ball, Oni flies for it. Atkinson's going to make that almost seven out of ten times. Two free throws on the way for the sophomore from Florida. And Odie wanted the kick ball here, but it wasn't a kick because it wasn't intentional. The ball can make contact with your foot if there's no intention to kick it. And then he made, he clear, created the contact with Odie, which was smart to make sure he'd get in front of him. And if Odie would have picked up his fourth there, that would have been disastrous for Yale. Good bounce back by them. Good possession to drive by Copeland, kick it out. They gave up a good shot for Bruder to get it into Atkinson in the following possession. Selection Sunday for the men's side today and selection Monday tomorrow. The reveal of the field breaking down every team, every matchup in every region. 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on ESPN with a bonus hour of coverage to follow that on ESPNU. And you got a great women's title game as well in the Ivy League. Coming your way at 4 Eastern on ESPNU. Number one, Princeton, and number two, Penn. Princeton, the two-time Ivy Player of the Year, Bella Allery leading their squad, just a junior. Love the decision to go three-quarter court trap there. Harvard did a good job breaking it, sped him up, but they've got rim protectors in the back, and Bruner and Atkinson. Bruner gets a great block. This building is live right now as Yale is coming back after Harvard built a little bit of a cushion. Crimson up three. Back and forth we gone. Somebody's going dancing today. Like it. Harvard or Yale, regular season co-champions. Yale is responsible for the Ivy League's last NCAA tournament win. They got 31 from Makai Mason to beat Baylor back in 2016. You see the success. They won two games in 2010, a game in 13 and 15 for Harvard. Yale winning in 16. You think about the Princeton team that went 14-0 in 2017, lost by two to Notre Dame. That was a battle. And then last year, Penn's winner, Penn the league winner, in my opinion, got shafted with a 16 seed. They were not a 16 seed. They played KU, Kansas, ended up losing. It was a closer game than, than the score indicated at the end. And Bill Self will be the first one to tell you that was not a 16 seed. And when Cornell went to the Final Four, or to the Sweet 16, rather, in 2010, they were the first team to go that far from the Ivy since the 79 Penn team went to the Final Four. Again, Penn, not Penn State. People got confused. Holy cow. Aiken, a lot of contact there, but the officials with no whistle saying he was the one who created it. And you see Trey Phillips actually going over to try to talk to Earl Walton to tell him, like, I didn't do anything, don't, thank you for not calling that, but no, he's creating the contact. And look at Phillips, one of the most athletic guards in this league. Aiken, you know, doesn't want to box out, and that's what happens. Followed the ball, not, not looking for his man on the backside. And Yale's right back in this with the ball. Yale looking for its fifth. NCAA tournament appearance and the Crimson trying for their sixth and first since 2015. Only with two defenders. Can't get the pocket pass to Atkinson. Out of bounds off of Harvard. That had their biggest lead at seven points, 52-45. And since then, it's Yale running off six straight. It's really about, this game is about getting stops. I mean, it's, both these teams are shooting at just around 55% from the field. They both are really good offensive teams, and Aiken's going off, but you've got to be able to string together stops to win this ball game. And right now, Yale is taking over, scoring on four straight possessions. Tough bucket for Oni. This is first basket since four minutes to go in the first half at a big time.
Kirkwood could have had it from the left side, tried for the reverse, didn't get rim. Five on the shot clock. Aiken splits the defense, draws contact, goes up. Nodi's upset because that's going to be four. How about the composure by Bryce Aiken to get that ball in the corner with about three, four seconds on the shot clock? I thought for sure he was going to put up that shot. His own, he's frustrated. He does not. With four seconds, he decides to drive. It's the right move. That's tough because when he goes up, it looks like he's trying to wall up straight up and down. And that's Aiken creating all that contact. That he's walled up straight up and down. That is a tough call, especially when it's your fourth. So we're back to back days. An impact player is saddled with his fourth foul. Yesterday, it was Stevens for Princeton, who ended up fouling out of the game with about three minutes to go. And only that's the beneficiary of that. He scored eight of his 15 second half points when Stevens, a former league defensive player of the year, was sent to the bench for good. Now with this lineup, you've got to rely on Alex Copeland. He, and a lot of these guys can score. We've said it all game. But he's going to be a guy that's got to key some more offense for them. And Trey Phils as well can look to be more aggressive. Going aerial on his last few drives. Great athlete. Third foul on Lewis. Got great length. He's explosive. And just a simple jab step, jab step, drive baseline that got him there. And we've talked about his offense. But he helped lock down one of the best scorers in the league, Desmond Cambridge, in their two games against Brown this year. Hold him to 8 for 35 from the floor. That's a heck of a testament to Phil's because Cambridge, that dude can create some shots and makes a lot of tough ones. Very talented player for Brown. Brown has a lot of really young, talented players. As does a lot of guys in this league. This league is still pretty young. They brought back everybody last year. Every first and second team all-league player came back this year. Now the majority are still returning for next year. Phils keeps Aiken in front. It's a big mismatch. Kirkwood should take his time. Lots of he hooked him. Offensive foul. Swain sold it for sure. But that's a better move because Kirk Kirkwood went up with it. He doesn't really need to do that. He has the strength and the footwork just to get around Swain. Yeah, so, sold the heck out of it, but he's got moment. 30 pounds on him. <laughs> 30 pounds, he's got height, length, and athleticism. <laughs> Trying to run Swain off a lot of screens, make Aiken guard. Wow, contested three, nothing Aiken could do. Made the comparison earlier, but I'll say it again. For anybody that follows this league, those Harvard teams from a couple years back, Laurent Rivard, the Canadian, was a sharpshooter, came in and made differences in games, knocking down threes. Swain's the same way. Assist, Aiken, triple for Kirkwood. Timeout, Harvard. That was a tremendous pass by Aiken, and more shot making in this game. We're coming right back to the Ivy League Championship game in 30 seconds. Back here at Yale, and this was a design play. Azar Swain took the ball to start the possession, threw it to the wing, came off a double screen. They ran Aiken off screens. They want to make him work on the defensive end. He got squared up on the catch, but then he didn't contest. And that's what Tommy Amaker, right when they made the three, called the timeout. And Amaker went right to Aiken to talk to him again. You have to make Swain put the ball in the deck. Don't react to any jab step. Don't give him any airspace. Make him put it down, and you've won the battle. That was a good look for him again. Justin Bassey, their best defender, gets Swain now on this assignment. A lot of bodies fighting for that rebound. Foul goes on Jordan Bruner for Yale, his first. I think everybody in the building, including Harvard, thought it was on them. This lineup, I'd like to see Kirkwood go in the post again and take Swain in there. That's an advantage. Well, they cleared out Kirkwood on the baseline to create space for Aiken. It's swept out by Lewis to Kirkwood. 
Rejected by Bruner. Second time belongs to the freshman Kirkwood. Playing a great game to stick with it and the smart. He didn't take a contested three. Reynolds did a good job of contesting late. Shot fake gets in the lane, sticks with it. And almost had a big steal there. Tommy Amaker gave Kirkwood really high praise earlier this year, comparing him to Wesley Saunders, the, the most decorated player the programs have. And that's impressive coming from a coach like Amaker on a first year player. Blocking foul, no bucket. And Tommy Emmerker told me about Kirk when we talked in October. He said, when you see him play, this kid's he's going to be special. And he really loved the way that his, his competitiveness, his fight, his skill level, his ability to pass. And he's a very good passer. But then when you get in, in the Division One level, things sometimes speed up for you. And for every freshman, really, it takes time to slow it down. He's, he was saying he's just now got it and slowed down and under control in the last month of the seeing that play. The Bulldogs out X and O'd the Crimson on that play to find Reynolds. Yeah, no communication there, and Reynolds slips through for a wide open layup. <laughs> Who's going to be the one to go? Five seconds. It's Juricic for three. Reynolds wanted Bruner, the bounce to Phils. Challenged by Juricic. Interesting that as Lewis comes down the floor there, didn't go to the rim, but instead settled off to the short corner. And he should rim run and try to bury Bruner. Contested step back, and Bassey's second effort no good. Kirkwood's got to be easy. That's a bad shot in this situation. Understand time and score. You allowed your team opponent to get in transition, and Copeland did just that with a huge M1. 10.47 to go. There are two questions about this game. Who's going to win and represent the Ivy League in the NCAA tournament? The second? Can this game just last forever? I wish, Michael. Like the title of an old Rocky and Bullwinkle episode, it's called Noah's No-No or Kirkwood's Kerfuffle. Wow, love that intro. This is what you're doing, dealing with the freshman, though. Noah Kirkwood's going to be great, but you got to understand the time and score in the game here right now. This screen is set by Phils. He's got to recognize Juricic didn't get over. He's dead. You've got to call that switch, and you've got to bail your teammate out. But sometimes, again, as a freshman, you haven't been in the situation before. You're not able to take the bull by its horns. So keep going with Rocky and Bullwinkle and find a way to get back there and make the play defensively. That was a simple up screen. Now on the other side, we saw him take the quick shot, which led to transition, which led to this layup and won. That's five points right there. Kirkwood is great, rookie of the year. But it is really hard to win a freshman in this league because it is a really smart league, obviously. Now we'll see if Harvard can pull a rabbit out of its hat. Oh, man. Go the other way against Bassey. I think James Jones has coached a great game. And the, the, the changes in using some zone at times, mixing in the press at the right time, and they've all paid off. This is a one, two, two, three quarter court press. And Bassey, I don't know where he's going there, because even if he doesn't bump Swain, Swain's totally squared up. He's going to have to pick up his dribble because he just crossed half court. If he goes to pick it up to make a pass, he's in a dead area. It's just not a good spot. You want to get that reversed again or drive right before the half court to get the trap to come to you, skip it to the other side and let that guy beat him. He'd have been giving them an extra defender on the sideline. Yeah. And the mid-court line as he came across. Copeland draws two. Atkinson got it, puts it up. Wow, this is a tough team on the glass. And as Tommy Amaker told us in the locker room before the game, and you said as well, the most talented team in the league. Yep. Most talented team in the league. He knows it. You can't give them extra opportunities. You can't make turnovers that are that 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 are unforced. And right now, Harvard's gone through a little bit of a struggle here as Yale's ratcheted up the defense and have started to execute offensively. And after you've got your bracket all figured out, well, that might take a little while. But hey, <laughs> Sunday night we've got a great game for you. Timberwolves Rockets, 9 Eastern tonight on ESPN and the ESPN app. NBA great product. That'll be a great game.
The March is college basketball time. And today's selection Sunday is going to be that, that first taste of what the 68 is. Such an exciting time in college hoops as they stick with the three-quarter court press. If nothing else, it makes Aiken work harder just to get the ball up the court, kill some time on the shot clock. Open up space for Haskett on the baseline. Haskett, that's a great take. Again, you got to finish. Great take. Mismatch inside. Reynolds knows it. He sees they want a double. Garden a big. From the corner, the foul. The Yale bench is about to have a Vesuvian eruption if that went in. I was trying to find a... Uh, Pompey references. It, it, it didn't come to be quick enough, but anyway, great recognition. And Aiken's trying to double down there to help his other guard partner take a look at the foul. Ooh, I thought it was a foul when we saw it live, but when you look again, I'm not sure he actually made contact with the arm. Couldn't see his lower body if he didn't allow him to land, but the call made, the referee made the no motion that he hit him on the arm. We're sitting right next to the Yale bench, and James Jones looked at me after that whistle blew and gave me the kind of look that said, I think I'm aging 10 years during this game. <laughs> Doesn't look like it, though, I'll tell you that much. Man, it looks it like he's found the 30. fountain of youth. And I'm being told by our guys in the truck to have multiple looks right now, but he did make contact, so it was the right call. Offensively for Harvard right now, when you look at this lineup, it's got a small group, really. You've got three guards on the line on the in the game, and Haskett, Aiken, and Juzang to handle this pressure that's going to come at them. Maybe able to beat it and score, and look to score and attack it. The other problem that presents itself, though, is a lack of size on the glass and defending Yale right now. We'll see what happens. Oni went to the bench almost five minutes ago. 10 nothing run, make it a dozen. Copeland gets the bounce. Timeout, Crimson, as it's 70 59. Sometimes bad shots become turnovers. And in, in, in that situation, Aiken's the man. He's been killing it all game, but they needed a good shot. They needed a good possession. Didn't take it. Took a quick three, contested three. He's short, back to back games. It's tough. And then this team's in transition, they're deadly. I can't tell you how hard this is. He is in a dead sprint. And you see Juzang stepped up to take a charge, but Okopa knows I'm going to get to my spot, stop, elevate, knock it down. He's made a career out of making mid-range shots, which is antiquated in today's game, but he's still very good at it from 12 to 18 feet. Ken Palm data goes back to 2001 in terms of tempo, and Yale had been in the top 100 in tempo three times, most recently 2006. Jordan Bruner was injured last year. James Jones just moved his eyes to answer the question of why his team was the fastest in the league in top 40 this year and looked at Bruner. Yeah. Now, granted, you've got other guys like Oni and Copeland, but the, the consensus among those three is somebody who can take the rebound, not have to pass, go 94 feet for two. And have multiple ball handlers. So it's not like a guard is coming back to get the ball. If Bruner has it, he can go, to your point. If he gets it, looks up, he can throw it to whatever guard it is, and they feel confident and comfortable that he can lead, they can lead the break. And they're surging right now. 12 0 run. Their largest lead of the afternoon. And they've outscored Harvard by 10 since the player of the year, Mie Oni, went to the bench with his fourth foul with about 14 minutes to go. Talk about needing to string stops together. Right now, Yale is five guys playing together defensively, and it's helping their offense because they keep getting out in transition. Do they have anyone capable of stopping Copeland off the dribble one-on-one? -on -one? Not when he's got a head of steam like that. They really, really do not. I mean, Juzang's a pretty decent defender, Rio Haskett is, but when he's getting a full head of steam downhill, you're, you're not stopping him. Now, Paul Atkinson, this is a mismatch. He does a good job of giving space, keeping him in front. Copeland gets back cut, but there is Blake Reynolds, a senior, to bail out the other senior, Alex Copeland, who really lost, he lost his man there. That doesn't happen often. Copeland missing a free throw. He made 20 straight. He'd come in with 22 in a row coming into this game, and Yale, as a team, had made their last 35 prior to that attempt. See Oni on the bench. I mean, there, there aren't many teams in the country, and it's 
historically, not in this league, where you lose the player of the year for a stretch, and not only are you okay, your team makes, expands the lead because of the depth of talent they have, one through seven. And right now, you have Harvard needs to get a guy in the middle of that one, two, two, quarter court trap. They do not. Haskett has that same baseline drive. That was a tougher finish, but couldn't get it to go, and we're off to the races again. And Copeland does it again. They need somebody got to want the ball in the middle of that thing that can turn and go and attack. It's a great take by Aiken, body searching, looking for contact there. I think you need to go for Tommy Emmerich or some of the other veterans that have been there. I think Lewis, Chris Lewis, can help them on the offensive end when they do get in the half court, help them on the glass a little bit. And Justin Bassey, a guy that's given them great minutes in the past, a good defender that can knock down shots and create a little bit, because right now this team offensively is really reliant on Aiken in that three-quarter court trap. They're not breaking it to score. I keep saying you need somebody in the middle to come want the ball, be able to turn and go. And right now everything's a real struggle on the offensive end, and it's very easy for you. That free throw ended a string of 15 unanswered points scored by the Bulldogs. And the lead is a dozen. Nevertheless, Harvard still has to make some baskets to get back into this. They've missed their last seven. That possession favors the Crimson. A little bit slower pace rather than off of a missed shot. With the Bulldogs speeding back down the floor. Aiken creates contact again. And with his defender inside the restricted arc, it's a blocking foul. Good take by Aiken. I think that was a sharp block because he was inside the restricted arc. Good call. Nice pull up by Copeland there. Now this is a Harvard team. Remember, they were down six here with two minutes to go and found a way to win. Don't go away. Crimps are not out of this yet. Just a couple of the six conference title games today, ending with the Big Ten. James Jones' day yesterday didn't end until about 2 in the morning. Was up watching tape, got up at 6 to work out, was in the office by 9, tip off at noon. That's the life of a college coach trying to get to the big games. That's how it works, man. Putting in the work and the upfront to be able to have the joy and the memories that come with going dancing again. They did it in 2016. They beat Baylor in that opening round game. Almost beat Duke. Came back and then blue fall into Duke. He wants to take his team back to the tourney. They've got 731. They've got to continue to do it on the defensive end. And offensively, they've been really good. But a lot of that has been sparked by their defense. They've been playing in secondary, playing in transition. Because of the defense, they've held Harvard to two for their last 13 over the last nine minutes of play. When they went in 2016, it was their first time since 1962. The New York Times article after that game made all these references to all the things that had started in 1962. You start reading, oh my goodness. That's right. Crush it. Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> Loose ball, oh, and it was tipped. Clarence Armstrong, the official, made the signal that it was tipped, and so it stays here. Good officiating coming over and helping. Oh, Walton and Armstrong talking. That was the right call. Aiken did get a piece of the ball. Historically speaking, at the top of this league, Harvard and Yale may not be the basketball rivalry, that everyone would talk about as the first one, but within the last five years, number one, for sure. Harvard's won seven of the last nine titles. Yale's won three of the last five. They shared one with Harvard and lost that playoff in 2015. So th this is the biggest rivalry in the league in terms of life and every other sport, and now it's become the same in hoops. Aiken, with an easy two, has now got 33. His fifth career 30-point game. And that change in dynamic from Penn and Princeton is why we have this tournament, too, because those two teams dominated for so long. Oh, wow! Man. Jordan Bruner trampolined his way to the rim and nearly brought it down with him. Azar Swain's playing a phenomenal game. Broke the pressure there, gets it up top to Bruner, and lets him throw it down. Aiken again! 
A step back three, just like he was doing in the first half when he scored 21. Tommy Hamaker's urging his guys along and telling Kirkwood, you've got to be able to fake and get back. You can't sell out and help situations with a, you know, a Skywalker with a group like Gruner behind you. Kirkwood pulls up, he's not missing. That's his spot. This is his gym, his spot. He's a senior, and he continues to get to those areas where he loves to pull up. Kirkwood, he was hit by Atkinson once he put the ball on the deck. But what the hometown crowd is mad about is that there wasn't a whistle under the basket. Here's Swain, and you see Kirkwood just sits stuck in no man's land. And that's what Tommy Amico was saying before. You've got to be faking up the line earlier. Don't let him get downhill with that head of steam. And when you're in that point in time and you're in no man's land with the Skywalker behind you, you've now given them a highlight. So you're saying you've got to have a force to stop the Skywalker? There you go, Yoda. Well done. One and one. <laughs> Kirkwood's got it. 64% free throw shooter. And we talked about his progression throughout the course of the year. Came from a really talented grassroots program as well. Brookwood Elite on the Adidas circuit. High level teammates, high level competition there. Tommy Emmerker sticking with this group, guard dominant, able to maybe put a little more pressure on the ball, affect some of the guards and the ball penetration they continue to get. But right now, it doesn't look like Juzang's doing anything to stop Copeland. It's incredible. He just went right by him. Just right by him. Inside out, downhill. He had 16 yesterday, 22, still with five and change to play. Late challenge from Bruner was enough to alter the shot. Aiken has been everywhere for offensive rebounds. And Juricic finishes underneath. That's a huge play. Keeping this thing in touching distance to get that rebound. And a really smart play by Aiken. And Juricic, I love the minutes he gives, man. The energy, he understands how to play. He cuts to the right spots. He makes big threes. And he's a really good finisher around the rim. Only a sophomore. Again, tons of young talent on this Harvard team. I mean, everybody on the floor is coming back. And you got Seth Townsend, player of the year last year, waiting in the wings to recover from injury. And it just... And a loaded defense. recruiting class. And a loaded recruiting class. Offense, defense there with Reynolds going out. Remember, he's in foul trouble, put Atkinson back in. There's Towns trying to urge his guys along. As are the Harvard fans that have traveled. Foul on Reynolds, his fourth. Joining Oni. Copeland working off the ball. Swain, seven to shoot, hand in his face, three off glass! Whoa! Yale hasn't missed their last five shots. Bryce Aiken says, I don't care what they're doing, I'm going to just keep on scoring. I mean, that is just, those are so backbreaking, Mike. I can't explain to you. When you're that was good defense by Haskins. He's in his grill. He still chooses to shoot it. That's a bad shot. And it banks in. And at the biggest stage of the best time, those just really hurt. But they didn't solve. Aiken gets going the other way with a quick bat through a pick. Swain now four of five from three. Tonight, 7 Eastern on ESPN. To crowd a desk, we got Reese, <laughs> Jay Will, Jay Bill, and Seth Dickey V to break down the brackets and some special guests as well. The party starts with Sports Center 515. Reese and the guys reveal the NCAA men's field of 68 as the teams are announced both on ESPN and the ESPN app. Joe Lenardi's latest bracketology projections for these two teams. If Yale's a winner, a number 13 seed, and if Harvard prevails, seeded at 14. 
And what, what scares people about this Yale team watching any high major that's watching, waiting, there'll probably be a, a three seed, a four seed that would play a 13 seed, is the fact that, yeah, you got an NBA player in Mieone, and he is deadly, but he's had four fouls and he's been slow, but there's all these other guys that can help. Alex Copeland, the senior, he's been absolutely stupendous today, getting into the lane over and over again, facilitating for himself and his teammates. Blake Reynolds, the senior, he's dealt with foul trouble. He's in double figures, as is Copeland, as is Azar Swain that comes off the bench, a sharpshooter. One through seven, this team can hurt you. They're an elite offensive team, elite shooting team, and anytime you can do something at a very, very high level, or one of the top 20 shooting teams in the country, you can knock off one of the big boys. Well, Olney comes back on the floor, almost 10 minutes on the bench since he picked up his fourth foul. 14-13 to play. And Yale outscored Harvard by nine in that stretch. Bruner right in front of the rim. It's a loose ball, just kind of, it looked like it could have been turned over. Ends up being a dunk, similar to Swain banking in the three. It just seems like it's the Bulldogs' day. Aiken nearly lost it, swarmed by three defenders. Jump ball, the Crimson keep it at that end. How much pressure do you think he feels right now to be the guy? A lot, but he loves that moment. I mean, talking to the Harvard coaches, they were, they were telling me the other night, there are times where they're drawing up plays and da 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 and he goes, okay, okay, if that doesn't work, just give me the ball and get out of the way. And that, that's kind of how his mind works, that he can take over. Now, he can, and he has. He's done it in the past, he's do it, done it today at parts, no doubt, but he's got to still remain a facilitator, too. He's in his most deadly when he's scoring, but also playmaking for others, which he's going to draw a ton of attention. Phil's got his hand up. And a whistle. Some contact with the rim. And a foul on the ball. 3.53 to go. Yale by 12 over Harvard, eyeing the NCAA tournament. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is presented by TIAA. Live your definition of success with TIAA.org. You're 100% right, Farney. I mean, it, it's it's big to have, especially in a big in a tournament, have a big time guy to go to like Oni and have an NBA player. But the depth is what's going to scare other teams. When you look at Alex Copeland, his athleticism, quickness, ball handling, playmaking ability, he's a high major player. Trey Phil's a high major athlete. Jordan Bruner, high major athlete. All those guys, though, also have a high skill level. Can make threes, can put it on the deck, can shoot it. And again, they're one of the top 20 shooting teams in the country in terms of effective field goal percentage. This is a team that you're not going to want to see because they are an elite offensive team. And when they're not turning the ball over, Mike, that's when they're really deadly. They've curtailed that in the last month of the season. That was their Achilles heel early on. Their depth is bolstered by the fact that, unlike other teams in this league and around the country, they're almost 100% healthy. Yes. Ivy League rosters are notoriously lengthy. You might see 20 <laughs> names yeah, on a man. roster. Of course, the rotation is going to be 8 to 12 as it is for everybody. But James Jones said, look, I got 18 dudes. 17 of them are healthy, with the exception of Jalen Gabadon. It really is unique at this time of the year. They're not banged up. They feel fresh, and they're playing that way right now. But Oney. I will say again, Harvard won this game here when they were down six with two minutes to go. They're not giving up. They're right there. Yale has to finish this thing out. Wow. Haskett just got a hand on Copeland. That was a big thing in the game they played here, too, where Yale fouled a number of jump shooters, being Bryce Aiken, who was 13 of 15 from the line. They fouled him on four different jump shots, two of them being threes. But in this game, Yale's gotten fouled a lot on jump shots. Swain, Copeland here. I mean, that, that, those are big moments where you just got to be able to contest straight up, and if he makes a tough shot, just live with it. I wonder if this out of a free throw situation, you throw a little uh, three-quarter court trapping. Not really trapping. Again, looking to slow down, looking to waste some shot clock, looking to get them off balance. Because it was so effective earlier, they've gone away from it the last few possessions, but maybe tossing it on now. Yale 
by 13 as they look to go to the NCAA tournament for the fifth time. Harvard trying for its sixth appearance. And they do go to the press. Burns, eight seconds off the clock, makes Aiken work a little bit. Bassey just in the game, out for Juzang. They got some space from Atkinson. Three-point try short. A bowling pin collision under the basket. Ball goes out of bounds. That's, that's a lot of friendly fire right there. Bassey and Kirkwood hitting each other hard, both competing for the ball. Kirkwood reaching for the right hamstring right away. Just got to handle the pressure, want the ball, strong with the ball, meets your passes. I've seen a couple guys slip, when they put that logo, the logo down sometimes, yeah. It wasn't the handles. No, it definitely wasn't. Copeland's got him, he just wasn't using him right then. This is a mismatch in size and strength. Oh, he goes, he's stripped, but fouled as he went up. That was the right call and the right decision by Oni. He can raise up and shoot over Juzang, but at this point in time, you want to force the issue. You want to get going toward the basket and either go through or around Juzang or make somebody else make a commit to you, and he was going to try to play man. If this is the first time you're watching Mie Oni play, just know that in his junior year of high school, he was not on track to be a Division I player. Far from it, as a matter of fact. He was going to go play at Williams. A great Division III program. He would have scored 5,000 points at Williams. He went to post-grad year. James Jones saw his highlight film, so James told me before, he's the only guy I've offered to, to come here without ever seeing him play live. So I have a tape, that's it, we're done. And man, right move, good coaching decision, good recruiting decision, this kid comes here. And he's gotten better year over year to get to this point. Great job developing his talent. This year became just the third Yale player to be named Ivy League Player of the Year in just his junior season. Aiken doesn't do it, and Bassey got it. Full court pressure, and Copeland breaks it himself. Man. One man press offense. Curly Neal over there. Oof. He had Oni. Oni's walking over to tell him. Hey, you got me, you got me. <laughs> he says, I know, I know, my bad. You got when you're up 13, I guess you could do that a little bit, but we're not playing the Washington Generals. He can pass. Yeah, you can. Like right here is where he looked up and he had Oni, and Oni wanted it. And he said, ah, I'm going to keep it. Yeah. Right call on the bump, too. Kirkwood's got a little too close to him. And a rare miss for him, but he shot that he was already coming off the line. Usually his form is impeccable. He finishes ten toes in the floor. You want to get your hand almost like you're shooting out of a telephone booth. If anybody knows what a telephone booth is anymore, to get your hand up and out of the booth and over the top with a little crane's neck and hold all that. But he was off the line right away. Well, you just made a whole generation nostalgic for having to keep a quarter in your pocket. And a whole generation being like, what is he talking about? 2.20 to play. Akins creates space on the crossover. Three-point try wide, long rebound. Scooped by Catchings, he hits the deck hard. And he'll get a couple of free throws, much to the chagrin of James Jones throwing yeah. his hands in the air saying, why are we fouling? Yeah, and we got, we suppose, really what he's saying, honestly, Mike, is we got to rebound the ball. We've got, we've got to rebound the ball. Again, Harvard's the best team in the league in terms of offensive rebounding percentage. They crash the glass hard, they've got good athletes. But they've done a really good job of containing that most of the game. He wants us to close this game out. He does not want to allow any type of crazy, wacky comeback. You're getting stops, you got to finish it. Catchings became a starter just in the last few weeks of the season. Amaker said, we know what you're doing in practice. We see your hustle. We see your improvement. You wait your time. It's going to come, and it has for the freshman.
with back dribble. Now somebody's got to present themselves and want the ball. Yeah, they only got six seconds to get it across midcourt. And it's a Yale timeout. Selection Sunday, a huge day in college basketball. So much going on around the country. One of six title games today in college basketball. It wraps up with the Big Ten, the American at 315 on ESPN, and then the field revealed later tonight with Reese and the gang on ESPN. Alex Copeland has been the catalyst for Yale. He really has. He's been outstanding on the offensive end. He, defensively, they were able to get things going defensively, which led to him getting out of transition. When he gets ahead of steam going downhill, there is just no shot you're going to stop him. And this is what makes him special, his speed, his quickness, and his ability to stop on a dime. These aren't the same play. You're just seeing the same move, getting to the spot, elevating straight up and down. And those were made in the critical run when they expanded, came, came from down at one point, to expanding and getting a lead and taking control of this game. Tuning in, looking for the Sun Belt Championship game from New Orleans. That game airing right now on ESPN News, and we'll get you there right after this one's over. Nassi soaring in, creating the contact, and that's his foul. Reynolds just made the step late enough. When you're getting pressed, you've got to make be strong with the ball, make strong passes, but step to the ball. And he stepped to the ball just in enough time to beat Bassey to it and cause the foul. See him lose his, leave his feet, you don't do it, but he, oh, he was standing there and then finally leaned forward, finally moved toward the ball to get the foul. You gotta step and meet him. It's been a remarkable two days for Yale. And of course, we're still two minutes shy of the final buzzer. But they're doing this against the co-champion of the league. The most they scored in the Ivy this season was 98 against Cornell just a couple days after Valentine's Day. I don't know, they've scored 48 points in the last 15 minutes of play. When it was 17 minutes to go, they were trailing 52 to 45. But the offense was outstanding, but again, it was all cued by their defense, but they've got Harvard now shooting around 35% in this game. And they were up around 60 earlier in the game. crowd sensing the moment coming right now letting their team feel their adulation but now that we've already touched on this thing is rotating the thing being the tournament next up shoes on the other foot we're going to we're going to harvard you got princeton coming up but when harvard gets a chance to host this thing it'll be a little difficult Ninety-four, seventy-eight. Yale, minute forty-four away from clinching the Ivy League's berth to the NCAA tournament. They have been so good from the free throw line. Have missed two over the last de two days. Wise men used to always tell me foul shots win ball games. Well, this would help them take control of this game offensively. As they got to the line, and it's a, it feels like it's in the bank right now. Think about that too, as you talked about with Sean back in the studio earlier. What makes them dangerous is their depth and their versatility, but if they can repeat their performance from the stripe in the NCAA tournament, look out. Absolutely. It's, it's another weapon. You can get to the line and knock down shots confidently. Now, when you're playing in the tournament, you know, the, the vibe is a little different, the venue's a little different, the stakes are a little different, but you hope they can perform at the same level. Oni's worried about getting his fifth foul, just let Kirkwood go right by him.
Aiken, 38 points today. Six shy of the 44 he scored earlier this year against Columbia, the second most in a game in Harvard history. It'll be disappointing for the young man again. Again, a tremendous player. He felt the same pain his freshman year when they fell in this tournament. Last year, dealing with injury. Falling just short again, but we've said before, the future is bright, but right now the moment belongs to the Bulldogs. Kirkwood another foul. Corey Johnson giving great service to this Crimson squad. Checks in 25 and white. He's dealt with injuries this year. He's had great moments. A great shooter. Senior captain. Senior captain of a chance to, to have his swan song. Dealing with injuries throughout the Ivy League season. His role has changed over the years, but still a great player, great shooter. Talking to his dad earlier today. Wants to continue his career playing overseas in Europe. And I'm sure when he's done with that, he'll have quite a business career in front of him. And a nice gesture from Tommy Amaker as well to get Wisner Perez, another senior captain out there, only on the floor for the fourth time this year, but knowing how much this small moment will mean for a lifetime to his players. 100%. Just to be part of this tournament, part of the event, although falling short, you want to be the last chance to represent the person. Less than a minute now. The crowd here in New Haven has been sensing it for a while. Bruner, perhaps one last exclamation mark to help start the party for the Bulldogs as they get set to go to the NCAA tournament for the fifth time. Obviously, the motion of the moment running high. Great performance by these young men who were almost out yesterday. Down seven late. They found a way to battle back against Princeton and then to beat their rival in the fashion they did where, again, they were down, but they defended and they attacked offensively and they win it going away. When they beat Baylor in 2016, Makai Mason was the star. He scored 31 in that game in 2016. You don't want to see this. Azar Swain, Swain is down. Who's been important in this game. And they're calling for the training staff. Clutching the right ankle. You feel horrible for this young man. I can hope so much that this is nothing serious because with eight seconds left, you never want to see a guy go down, but especially like this, when it's about to be time to celebrate. And he's just tweaks it on teammate. Thomas Ryan's ankle off of his foot. Just moments after James Jones has emptied out his bench to allow the elder statesman one more trip onto the floor. They'll try to get him back to his feet. And it, Swain's had a critical game. I mean, 15 points off the bench. He made big threes, four of them. That one that banked in almost was a little bit of a backbreaker. He says, I'm OK. He's going to have to come off the floor. But he's putting weight on it, which is great to see. He's jogging, but with a limp. 
That's big good. exhale from everybody That's right good. there, especially him. Three short of 100. The players on this roster who played in that 2016 tournament game against Baylor, Trey Phils, one minute. Blake Reynolds, 10 minutes. They're going to be new stars for Yale in the NCAA tournament. 100%. That team was led by Justin Sears, Makai Mason, Armani Cotton. It's a different generation of guys now, but these guys built on the foundation those guys laid, and now they're going back to the dance. Yale, the champions of the Ivy League, going to the NCAA tournament for the fifth time. Five players scored at least 10. Copeland with 25 to lead the way. It'll be a sweet night on Selection Sunday for the Bulldogs. On behalf of our entire crew, my partner, Dallin Cuff, it's been fun. As all always. My cousins saying so long. Up next, we send you to Lakefront Arena in New Orleans, the Sun Belt Conference Championship. Another ticket to be punched.